so welcome everyone. We'll probably kick off now. Um, we'll have a few more people joining the session in due course, but um, we'll just get started since we do have limited time. We've got seven presentations today, which is really exciting. So welcome to the fifth and final special student session. Um, we have, it's on soil, soil system science, and we have a special guest, Dr. Nagranadasi Chiranda, who's joined us all the way from Colombia at the moment. Um, he was meant to be in Morocco, living in Morocco by now, but obviously the world has had other plans for Nagoni in the meantime. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through the structure of the session again. I think you're all quite familiar with them by now, but we will have a brief introduction by Nagoni to soil systems, um, greenhouse gas management science in general, and then we'll have the seven student presentations and then we'll have a discussion session at the end which we strongly encourage the research supervisors and any other senior researchers on this call to participate in as well um, that's one of the main reasons why we have the sessions and yeah definitely encourage engagement from student to student as well since you're all here um, so in saying that, please use the chat function in this session to record questions. We won't be doing um, the questions in the discussion until the end. So please do write down your questions as you listen to the presentations. And yeah, I think that's probably all you need to know for now. So yeah, I just want to introduce Mingoni, um, who's also a good friend of mine and yeah, met him I think a year and a, a year and a bit ago when I had first started working for the Secretariat um, was very fresh face and yeah, we got to spend time together in Colombia which was fantastic at Sea Art um, and Ningoni was one of the kind of key founders of the Cliff program which was the precursor to the Cliff Grads program um, so Ningoni's actually been involved in the Cliff Grads program since long before I have um, so he's very experienced in this. He is a soil and climate change scientist um, with a scientific background in soil science and agroecology. Um, he did postdoctorate research at Aris University in Denmark. I think, I believe as well, Ningoni was lead author on the IPCC's 2019 refinement to the 2009-2006 guidelines. Um, which we discussed a bit with Olia Glade and also with Andreas Wilkes. And Ningoni is also a co-lead um, to the GRA's Inventories and Nationally Determined Contributions Network, um, along with myself and two others from Spain and Australia. And I also happen to know that Ningoni is a podcast and audiobook fanatic. Um, and that he listens to podcasts and audiobooks at 1.5 times speed, which I think is really efficient. Um, I like to think I'm an efficient person, but I don't listen to podcasts and audiobooks at 1.5 times speed. So yeah, Ningoni, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, Eva. I'm really looking forward to this afternoon and from learning from, uh, from the students and what they are going to be, to be doing. So I will share my screen. Can you see my, my slides? Okay, great. Okay, so basically today we're going to be uh, having a lot of presentations related to soil systems, uh, the micro and the, the macro level. As you probably are aware, well, is like it's quite heterogeneous, and uh, it's really. I mean, if you look in the literature, there are different studies that show different and uh, sometimes contradictory results. And one of the reasons for that is because of the heterogeneity and the complexity of soils. But then, add to, on top of that, agriculture. I usually like to say agriculture is a culture, I and mean, it's the way you do things, right? It's the the culture of agriculture aims to effectively use available resources, including the soil. And uh, that means, and the objective of agriculture is to put food on our tables and money in our pockets. So how then do we make soils productive? 
So I've been thinking a lot about this. And one of the key things in order to make soils product productive is management. So how productive soils are going to be uh, depends on how depends on how you manage the soils. So management is, is very critical. So for change to happen. Okay. So, for change, so for change to happen, uh, our research and the research that we're going to hear about today needs to inform management improvements at different scales. So there is management in terms of uh, at the policy level, there is management at the regional level, there is management at the farm level, and uh, that is the management that then affects uh, soils. So basically all, all the, the policies and all the regulations end up incentivizing or decentivizing the way you manage your soils. So management is, is the key. I'll give you an example of uh, some of the work that was done uh, in Colombia. So if you look at that graph, uh, you can see there that if you are moving from a degraded pasture where management is poor to a uh, to a pasture that is some form of management. They have a grass legume pasture with fertilization. You can see there that your live weight gain is actually increasing about four times more just by management. So management is, is critical to move you from uh, degraded, uh, to, to move your productivity from 110 to around uh, 450 uh, live weight gains per hectare per year. So management is, uh, is key. Of the work that we did at with Siniro, who is also on this call, and uh, some other students, Cliff grad students, was uh, that they did. Uh, they we looked at what management would do to emissions of uh, nitrous oxide from a, a a pasture that is degraded or a pasture that is managed. So what we we observed there is that. You see the, the dots in black is where there is low vegetative cover. So the management is poor. And you can see there that the emissions of nitrous oxide from the urine deposited on these degraded pastures is actually higher all the time uh, compared to where there is, uh, where there is some, some management. So management is critical in reducing your emissions. So it's critical in increasing your productivity. It's also critical in reducing your greenhouse gas emissions. My supervisor once once told me uh, that Ngoni, if whatever you are doing does not put food on the farmer's table or money in their pockets, you you can as well forget it. So in some way, all our research needs to be contributing. The outcome of our research should be food on tables and money in in pockets. Maybe today, as we listen to the different presentations from the different students. Let's view these presentations from the lens of, are we putting food on the table and money in the pocket? And the key to doing this is how we manage the soil. So management is critical for us to achieve this. So uh, hopefully, we're, as we listen to all the talks today, we, were, we are going to see the importance of management. Thanks, Eva. Thanks so much, Ngoni. Yeah, that absolutely is the key. Um, if something is going to affect the profitability of farming, then obviously it's not it's not essentially a solution because it's not going to be taken up. So great, thank you. I'm just wondering if there are any questions for Ngoni before we move on to the student presentations. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you do have one. Hi, Ngoni. It's uh, Ferencia from Argentina. I was curious about the difference between uh, management or not. Uh, in the three points that you show in the beginning, there, was, there wasn't a huge, di uh, huge difference, uh, but it was in, the, in Brazil, and I, I don't remember the other point. What do we, would you attribute that difference to? Thanks, Lorenzo. Let me go back to the. 
Yeah, okay, so uh, so this is uh, Colombia. So there, it seems like there was no difference. So we, but we, when you zoom in, so if you look at this uh, graph here, uh, can you? Uh, am I sharing my screen? No, not at the moment. Not at the moment. No. Okay. Okay, so am I sharing now? Yes. Okay. So if you look here, and uh, I think this is uh, Suluma in Colombia, when you zoom in, because it's basically because of the scale, you cannot see that it seems as if there is no difference. But when you zoom in, you can see the, that there is a difference between the, the degraded and the non degraded uh, pasture. So in some cases, I mean, like in Argentina, I think the challenge was that there was, I think it was cold. So when you have, uh, uh, the emissions were lower in both the degraded and the non-degraded, hence the low emission factor. But generally, if you look, if you zoomed in, you could see that even under those conditions, management was still making a difference. So there is an issue of the, the heterogeneity of the soil, but as you can clearly see there, even, even under those conditions, the management is what is making a difference. Thanks. Paul. Hello, Ngoni. Hello, Ngoni. Hi, hello, hi. Yeah, this is Abu Bakar, your mentee. Oh, okay, hi, Abu Bakar, yeah, sure, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, yeah, fine, yeah. fine, fine. Yeah, going by your presentations, uh, more uh, more food in the table and more money in the farmer's pocket. Uh, what can you say about uh, practices involving uh, reduction in emissions? Because there is a lot of uh, controversies, uh, like uh, on the on the management practices. When you are targeting low emissions, it is likely you you are going to have a um, uh, low productivity, maybe in terms of reducing water quality, as some uh, water use efficiency, some uh, literatures are re uh, reporting uh, maybe reduction in yield with the adoption of alternate wetting and drying management practices over the continuous flooding. Uh, there, there, there is a lot of controversies regarding that. When you are targeting low emission, it's going to have sometimes negative effects on the productivity. When you are targeting high productivity, sometimes you are going to have high emission uh, factors. So, what can you say about this? Thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. That's a very good uh, question. Uh, I think if you look at it, I mean, uh, let's step back a little bit. What are where are emissions coming from? Really, emissions are a product of inefficiency. Whenever you see emissions in any system it basically means you are using something in an inefficient way. So if, for instance, you you are you have water all the time, I think Ole talked about alternate wetting and drying before, right? If you have continuous flooding, you you are you, you are using water inefficiently because even though rice is a thirsty crop, it's not thirsty all the time. So when you use some, something in your system inefficiently, you end up getting emissions. So for instance, if you, if you have a lot of fertilizer, that means you are using the fertilizer in an inefficient way, then you have a lot of nitrogen available for loss, right? So uh, emissions are a source of inefficiency in the system. Having said that, I think it, it now is on you and me, I mean, the, the researchers, the new generation, to see how can we then improve through management the efficiency of, of our system. If we improve the efficiency of our system, uh, we, as a byproduct, we also reduce the emissions that are coming from, from, from the system. But of course, in some cases, uh, I mean, the challenge is you, you need regulations, you need policies in order to, to curb the greed or the, to curb the, because the moment you produce more, you want to expand, right? In generally farmers, when they have uh, more production, like for instance, in the case of uh, the discussion in, in the livestock sector, where if you have, and if you intensify, farmers produce more, then they end up clearing more land to produce more. So you need policy to then regulate the kind of greed of, of our human greed, no? So I think to ask, in a, the short answer is, it is on you and me to conduct research to improve efficiency. 
and that will only be done through management. So we still get back to the same. Management is the key to both increasing productivity and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Sorry for a long, long winding. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Ningoni. So we have one more question from Alex. We'll have time for your question, Alex, if you would like to unmute yourself and then we'll move on to the student presentations. Yep, yes. Um, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can hear me? Yes. Yes, Alex, we can hear yeah. you. Yes, my question is about uh, population and management. In the slide you have shown, for example, about the countries, is there a relationship between management and population in terms of the emission factor versus productivity? That's my question. Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, sorry, sorry, I did not. I think it was, I didn't explain mostly what we did there. So what we basically did is that uh, we took we took urine from cattle and uh, we deposited this urine uh, in a degraded pasture and a, and a managed pasture. And what we see there is that every time there is, the pasture is degraded, the the emissions were higher, the nitrous oxide emissions were higher in that pasture compared to where you had management. So if you, the idea is then, of course, if you then increase your population of animals, that might also switch that, right? Because maybe in the well-managed pasture, you can have more cattle, right? So you might end up even having more emissions. But the challenge is the other benefits to having a, 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 a well-managed pasture. The first is your you are increasing the productivity of your animals, which is the objective of farming, right? More food on the table and more money in the pocket. You also have uh, more root biomass. So if uh, if your pasture is well managed, you have more roots that are within or from the pastures that you will be putting into the soil. So if you if you account for that as well, you might actually have a, end up having a a, a, a a net negative emission. So, but then you need to uh, to account for all these different other aspects. And the degraded pasta, basically, you are not producing so much. You are also not uh, having so much uh, carbon into the system. And you also have a lot of emissions from urine that is deposited. So if you then have a high population of cattle, of course, they will, you probably no won't have so high because there won't be so much feed. But if in, in the sense that if you have a lot of cattle there, you would have a lot of emissions, no, no sequestration and no production. So that is the, the way it links up with uh, cattle population. Great, thanks Ningoni. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, another excellent answer. I think we will move on to the student presentations now. So Maria, it would be great to start with you since we've already checked your audio, um, if you are able to unmute and share your screen. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me well? And see you as well. Okay. We can hear you, Maria. Okay. Um, is it fine? Yes, your screen is great. Thank you. Please, please go ahead. Okay. So, hello. My name is Maria Elisa. I am PhD candidate from Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. And now I am guest researcher at ISRIC World Soil Information here in Wageningen and in the Netherlands. Uh, my PhD project is called Agrohydrological Modeling and Soil Mapping in Brazil, and I am going to show you a little bit of it. Okay, let me pass the slide. Okay, so uh, my project is in a context, something between soil mapping and soil physics. We are basically uh, concerned about soil, hydro soil hydraulic parameters, such as the soil water retention and the soil hydraulic conductivity because they are major keys for hydrological modeling. And the objective would be something related to development of methodologies to generate georeferenced hydro, hydro, agrohydraulic estimation for Brazilian soils using process-based models and available soil data. 
the basic idea is to look for patterns. And we do that combining soil maps and PTFs and somehow evaluating the uncertainty and the, the results of it. The first stage of my project uh, I did when I was a guest researcher at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I was there for one year and a half. Uh, basically, we, we, we study uh, the field capacity in Brazilian soils, uh, producing soil maps uh, based on data available on soil grids, which is a product from ISRIC, where I work now. Uh, we combined that with PTFs and we used the swap model to simulate a drainage experiment uh, and see the results for field capacity under different uh, criteria. And then we try to evaluate the uncertainty related to that, which is a major key uh, in this kind of analysis because we have uncertainty related to the soil maps, to the model approach, uh, to the measurements, uh, to the PTFs that we use for the for the soil hydraulic hydraulic conductivity, but also for the PTFs that were used for soil water content. Uh, it also depends on the flux we use and also the scale. Uh, but we could observe some interesting things, such as the the field capacity values were lower than they usually adopted uh, for temperate soils. Uh, which also corroborate with another measure, measurement experiments. But one major key, which is the uncertainty, is kind of related with what I am doing here at ISRIC. Uh, here I am going to work basically in two projects. So I started um, in September and I'm going to stay until March of the next year. Uh, one of the projects is mapping soil organic carbon change to support climate change mitigations, which is basically uh, mapping soil organic stocks in space and time. I still didn't, uh, didn't start to work with that, but they developed a first part of this project, is already published, and the idea is to extend it globally. The, the first part was made just for Argentina. What I've been doing here uh, in this almost two months. I'm working in mapping so, uh, derived soil hydrological properties using machine learning. So we have the WOSIS database, we, which is a collection of data from the whole world in a standardized way. And we are interested in the water retention at 100, 330, and 1500 centimeters. Uh, so basically we have to convert the data uh, from volumetric from gravimetric to volumetric when, when that's the case. Uh, we have to check the consistency of that. And after we have like a, a organized uh, database, we want to apply digital soil mapping techniques, uh, uh, test covariates, and use this model to predict the points that we don't have measured. And we've, uh, we've been all this mapping um, techniques, uh, one of the important things is the evaluation of uncertainty. And that's somehow, uh, that's the major point that I want to link with, with my PhD project. So that's it in my five minutes. Thank you very much for listening. I am open to questions in the last minutes. Great, that was awesome. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I have some questions for you, but we'll ask them in the discussion session at the end. So for now, I will um, like to hand the floor to Eric Rodrigo de Silva Santos from Brazil also, um, who will be studying at Bangor University. So Eric, if you are there and able to unmute yourself and share your screen. Perfect. I'm just trying to put in the presentation mode. Can you see the presentation mode? It looks great. Yeah, it, it's in the presentation. All right. Yes, just, just 
Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Eric Santos and I'm from Brazil, as Hazel said. And then currently I'm doing my research stay at Bangor University with Dr. David Jones. And back in Florida, where I'm studying at the University of Florida, I'm doing a project um, about grazing cover crops and we are studying alternatives to improve sustainability and grow crop productivity in North Florida. And the Florida scenario that we have there is that uh, a lot of the, the lands, uh, most of the producers, they plant like grow crops, for example, cotton and peanuts. And this land, most of this land also is under irrigation. And whenever uh, the, the warm season is over, they do nothing with the land. Um, my presentation is, sorry about that. Uh, they do nothing with the land. And we, we can see a, a scenario as this one we have in here in the cool season scenario where they do not plant even cover crops in there. And uh, a problem that we have in the region specifically that I'm doing my study is that uh, uh, Jackson County also has the Florida Blue Springs, which is a first magnitude springs. And there's a, a, an increasing level of nitrates in the last decades, as we can see here in this figure from 1958 to around 2000 here, we can see the, the concentration of nitrates in the water in the Blue Springs and it, it's great, uh, it's increasing a lot. Um, so basically a cover crop is any crop that you can, that can grow, which provides soil cover, regardless if it's gonna be incorporated later in the soil or not. And in this context, we have some really good cool season forages that we can use as cover crops. For example, rye, rye grass, oats, and triticale. And whenever we, we have animals grazing these forages, they can improve their uh, performance as well compared to whenever they are grazing warm season forages. So, but there's a lot of space between uh, what's grazing, right? As we were discussing earlier, uh, everything's about management and we don't want to like overgrazing the forage and we don't want undergrazing the forage because we're going to be losing um, uh, uh, per area or we're going to be losing animal gain um, uh, uh, per animal, right? So we want to find something, some optimal zone between these two types of grazing management. And with that, I'm testing nine different systems there. First one, uh, the first set of treatments, I call them control, which is basically a conventional row crop. In the first uh, treatment, we have uh, only row crops there in the summer and no cover there in the winter. In the second treatment, we have uh, crops there in the summer, which is cotton, and then we have cover crops there in the winter at 34, uh, and we apply 34 kilograms of nitrogen. And um, the third one, we have uh, the, the same, but during the winter, we apply 90 kilograms of nitrogen. And then we have the intercrop livestock, which we have the same as the treatment tree, but we put the animals to graze the cover crops during the winter. For example, here in this treatment, the animals uh, they graze the cover crops every two weeks and they leave a residue of 2,500 uh, kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And in the second, they leave 15. And in the third season, they leave 500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare after the grazing. And these treatments are to be undergrazed, uh, moderate graze, and overgrazed treatments. And we have a similar um, set of treatments here. Uh, but instead of row crops during the summer, they have warm season grasses. And the animals, they, they're going to graze uh, these forages as the same way as they did in the set of treatments before, with undergrazing, moderate grazing, and overgrazing. And some of the ongoing experiments that we have right now are uh, the uh, we are evaluating the cover crops uh, above and below ground litter decomposition, and uh, we in the second study we are evaluating the soil chemical and physical properties 
as affected by grazing density. And in the third experiment, we are evaluating the nitrate leaching and row crop productivity as affected by cover crop and, uh, and grazing management. So here in the experiment one, uh, we are estimating um, the litter decomposition rate and the crop nutrient uptake according to the grazing intensity and rotational systems. And here are some variables that we are measuring as litter deposition, biomass, and nitrogen disappearance. And uh, basically, we put some income bags in the soil. And after a, a, a period of time, for example, uh, four days, eight days, uh, 16 days, 32 days, uh, until 110 weight. 128 days we go there and we collect these little bags and we analyze for carbon, nitrogen, and ST detergent and um, insoluble nitrogen as well. And then this in the second study, um, we we collect soils at from zero to 15 centimeters and also from zero to 90 centimeters. And we uh, separate these soils in different fractions and we analyze for soil particulate organic matter fertility and also for ammonia and nitrate mobilization in the soil, for example. And here are some of the pictures of the, that I have from this study where we collect the soils at 90 centimeters depth. And also, as you can see, like the POM here and MAOM is like the particulate organic matter which is um, mixed with some sand here. And here we have the mineral associated organic matter, but this is only from the first 15 centimeters layer. And in the third experiment, we evaluated the nitrate leach and row crop productivity as affected by uh, cover crop grazing management. And here we evaluated the, all the pastures, all the pasture uh, responses as herbage mass and herbage accumulation and digestibility and crude protein. And we also evaluated the cotton yield at the end of the season and the nitrate leaching in the water. Um, as we can see, we have these big lysimeters in, in, in every single plot and they are about like three meters deep. And that's, uh, and we go there every two weeks and we collect our water samples. Um, it, was, it, was, it is everything that I have for today. Um, I'm working the data analysis. I have some of the results, but it would be too long. But uh, I'm glad to share with you if you email me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. That was really great. Um, I'm just wondering if we can go to either Anthony or Ricardo. I see Anthony's joining and then dropping off. Um, Perhaps, Anthony, we can try to see if you can unmute. Share your screen. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi, Anthony, great, we can hear you. So are you able to share your screen as well? Let me... Hello, I won't be able to share my screen because I'm using my mobile phone. My network is very poor at this side, so I'm, I'm connected over the phone. Okay. Right. Okay. okay, in that case, we'll, we'll go to Ricardo because I don't have your presentation. Okay. Yet. So we'll open your presentation and we'll let Ricardo do his presentation now. And then we can go from there. So I'll just mute you again, Anthony. And if you're here, Ricardo, if you can please share your screen. Okay, that's fine. Are you there, Ricardo? We can't hear you at the moment, Ricardo. Um, uh, uh -huh. Hello. Hello. Oh. Uh, can you? Uh, I cannot share my screen. You can. You can't share your screen either. Okay. In that case, we'll start with one of the presentations um, that needs to be presented online, and we'll prepare your two presentations, and then we will go from there. So. 
I will start with Aminoe. Um, Aminoe George Amenchwe, who is from Cameroon. Um, he is being hosted by the USA, USDA Agricultural Research Service, the Northern Plains Research Lab in Sydney in Montana. And his PhD is the role of beneficial management practices for reducing soil greenhouse gas emissions and enhancing soil carbon sequestration from maize production systems in Cameroon. So I will share my screen now. Um, can you please make sure that Kronos is on mute? Mm -hmm. uh, Hi everyone, my name is Amanu George Amentry. I am from Cameroon. My Cliff Grad Host Institution is the Northern Plains Agricultural Research Laboratory in Sydney, Montana, USA. In my PhD thesis back here in Cameroon, I am working on the role of beneficial management practices on reducing soil greenhouse gas emissions and ensuring soil carbon sequestration in maize production systems in Boya, Cameroon. Agriculture emits between 5.0 to 5.8 gigatons equivalent of carbon dioxide in a year, and this is up to 13% of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gases being emitted into the atmosphere by humans globally. Even though Africa's agriculture is local tools and methods, emissions from the agricultural sector in Africa are among the fastest growing emissions in the world. Within the cropland systems, the tillage regime being uh, adopted and the soil amendments being added into the soil to boost productivity has an impact on soil greenhouse gas emissions and soil carbon sequestration. In the face of climate change and many other environmental challenges, the continent's biggest problem is to find a soil management practice that generates le uh, less greenhouse gas emissions and ensures more carbon sequestration, and at the same time ensuring food security. The first objective of the research is to measure the cumulative growing season greenhouse gas emissions as affected by tillage and crop amendment. The second objective is to measure the changes in soil microbial biomass carbon and nitrogen throughout the growing season as affected by tillage and soil amendment still. And the last objective is to examine the impact of tillage and crop amendment on maize yields. This research will be carried out in two growing seasons. And uh, to achieve this objective, a split plot design with three replications have been adopted at the University of Boya campus. To collect data on greenhouse gas emissions, we have installed flock density chambers where we manually extract gas with a uh, a syringe stored in airtight containers, and these uh, gases are being sent to the Northern Plains Laboratory for analysis with the gas chromatography. During these sampling events, we are also collecting data on soil water content, atmospheric air pressure, soil nitrate and ammonium, soil temperature and atmospheric temperature because these are parameters that greatly have an impact on soil greenhouse gas emissions in agroecosystems. To collect data on soil microbial biomass carbon and nitrogen as affected by tillage and crop amendments, we will collect soil samples when the crop, uh, when the crop is three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks, and twelve weeks, and these samples will be sent to the University of Chang Laboratory, and the chloroform formication method will be used to, to, to measure soil microbial biomass carbon and nitrogen. Where you must have gotten this result 
we will use the analysis of variance to test if there is a significant difference between um, soil microbial biomass carbon and nitrogen as affected by tillage and crop amendment. For the last objective, which is to measure maize use as affected by tillage and crop amendment, we will manually trash maize from their cups when they are ready, uh, measure the weight in kilograms and convert it in tons per hectare since the, the, the dimensions of the plots are already known. The study is being carried out at the University of Boya, which is found in the city of Boya, southwest region of Cameroon. Boya is located in the tropics in the slopes of, along the slopes of Mount Cameroon, which is the second highest uh, peak in Africa. Climate change is an emerging major threat to Africa's agriculture. And so this research will document the true contribution of soil management practices in reducing soil greenhouse gas emission and enhancing soil carbon sequestration in maize farms in Cameroon. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to engaging with you in other sessions. Great. Um, so I think everyone can hear me again. Um, Ricardo, we have loaded up your presentation. So if you can unmute yourself now, um, you can speak. So be with me. I'll just introduce you. So we have Ricardo Sanario from Brazil, um, and he is studying at Massey University in New Zealand. Um, Ricardo, if you could just let us know when you want us to go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, we are quickly to share your screen. Um, are you there, Ricardo? We can't hear you at the moment. Oh, sorry. Yes, hello. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, can you allow me to share my screen? Ah, uh, didn't realize you wanted to do that. Bear with me. You should, you should have permission to share your screen now. No, it's not possible. Maybe it might take a, a second, but you could try now. No. I think you've joined twice, Ricardo, so perhaps. Okay, thanks. Uh, um... Can you share now? I've just given your other. Okay. Otherwise, we can share. Here we go. Perfect. Great. All right, the floor is yours, Ricardo. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Ricardo Cesari. I'm from Brazil. My cliff guide host this organization is School of Agriculture and Environment, Massey University, New Zealand. My PDT is inoculation of brachiaria with the plant grow promotion bacteria, azospirillum and nitrospirillum, impacting the biomass production and greenhouse gas emission. Brazil has a pasture land area of 170 million of hectares, and the majority of these pastures are planted with general brachiaria. And 50% of these pastures are in different stage, states of degradation. 
and various factors contribute to pastry degradation, including improper management and the odor. And the management of pastry products becomes a great challenge to the sustainable management of tropical environment. And the inoculation of different forest species with the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, azospirillum brasiliense, and nitrospirillum can be an important ally in the, in the sustainable management. Uh, research objectives and select the plant growth promoting bacteria with the potential to consume nitro oxide in the soil to evaluate the nitro oxide emission and biomass accumulation in brachiaria inoculated with azospirillum brasiliens to determine the nitro oxide emission factor in partially as of brachiaria medicula inoculated with strains of azospirillum. Method, experiment one, nitro oxide emission from agricultural soil effect of soil inoculation with nitrospirillum and azospirillum brasiliense strain. In this, in this experiment, 50 azospirillum and 5 nitrospirillum stain were used. Nitroxide production in vitro and hard to be trained nitrogen and nitroxide after sorry, uh, for 24 hours. Experiment two, plant growth promotion, rhizobacteria, increase the efficiency of fertilizer while reducing nitroxide emission. And greenhouse gases pot experiment was conducent. Where well use it, three strains of azospirillum and two species of brachiaria were well inoculated. Brachiaria humidicola and Brachiaria decumbens. And natural oxide flux was measured 22 times during 65 days after any application. And experiment three, two Brachiaria humidicola inoculated with the plant growth promotion bacteria, Azospirillum brasiliense, reducing natural oxide emission from catrolinic parts in the tropics. The uh, third experiment will be conducent. Two strain will be used, and two brachiarium medicula and brachiarium resistance will be inoculated. Preliminary results experiment one nitroxide emission. Nitroxide emission per pot 0, 8, 6, and 25, 20 hour, hour after any application. And experiment two, biomass production in brachiarium humidicula and marandu inoculated with the two, two strain of azospirillum. Expected results, the mitigation potential of plant growth promotion in rhizobacteria inoculated in the tropical pasture, improved the biomass production in Brazilian pasture, and to develop a strategy to de that improve the quality of pasture in stage of degradation. Thanks. That was great. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, we will move on to the next presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Anton Mlambo, a PhD student with the Bindula University of Science and Education in Zimbabwe. And I'm a Zimbabwean. The title of my research is to assess the impacts of condo based water harvesting technologies soil water retention membranes and nutrient management options on soil organic carbon accumulation and greenhouse gas emissions from coarse textured soils in Zimbabwe. I have three objectives 
The first objective is to determine the effects of soil water retention membranes, tide and standard controls on soil organic carbon accumulation in agriculture production. And paper two will be to measure and quantify carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide from tide and standard condos, subsurface soil water retention membranes from coarse textured soils in Zimbabwe. And finally, paper three will be to determine the effects of different nutrient soil management practices on greenhouse gas emissions released from condo based water harvesting technologies in Zimbabwe. Soil samples uh, as a baseline from block one and these were collected from 0 to 10 centimeter depth, 10 to 20 centimeter up to 80 to 100 centimeter depth. And the results indicated that organic carbon is relatively higher in the upper soil surface and decreases as we go down the soil profile. These results were almost similar in, in the second plot where we also found that percent organic carbon is relatively higher in the upper layer of the soil surface and decreases as we go down the soil profile. We also did some soil temperature measurements from the two plots, the soil water attrition treated plots and non soil water attrition treated plots. And in replication one, week one, the results indicates that soil water retention treated plots have relatively higher temperatures of about 37.38 degrees Celsius against 30.3 for non-treated soils and overall soil treated soils with the soil water treatment technologies have higher soil temperature as compared to non-treated soils. The results are also similar in replication 2 where soil water retention treated soils recorded a relatively higher soil temperature as compared to non-treated soils as indicated by, indicated by the bars in this slide. The, the research is being conducted in Ntare district in Marange where two sites have has been selected at Maocha and Marange homesteads, where soil water retention technologies and standard controls were established. Measurements of greenhouse gases will be done using static chambers beginning this rain season. Time series will be used to calculate greenhouse gas fluctuations and also linear reg regression will be used to determine the relationship between soil water retention practices and carbon dioxide fluxes. In conclusion, so far the preliminary results have indicated that soil water retention technology increases soil temperature at 15 to 30 centimeter depth and the amount of soil organic carbon is a little bit higher in this upper soil layer is shown in the baseline results. Another sample of results after installing the soil water retention technology has been collected and submitted to Soil Chemistry Research Institute for analysis and the results are still to be out from the lab. I thank you so much. So I'm just going to shift now to Bethel. 
um, Giramu, I apologize, Beth, all if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, she's not able to actually join us today, um, but she is doing her PhD um, Cliff Grads experience at the Soil and Water Conservation Research Unit in, in Pendleton in the USA. So I will put her um, presentation on now. Hi everyone, I'm Betel Garamo from Ethiopia, a PhD candidate in Climate Smart Agriculture and Biodiversity Conservation at Haramea University, Ethiopia. And um, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank the Cliff Grad uh, and my host organization, as well as my supervisor, Dr. Hero Gorani. So to start, uh, my presentation, let me introduce you the title uh, for my PhD dissertation. It uh, says Modeling Impact of Climate, Land Use, Land Cover Change and Soil Management on Soil Organic Carbon Stock Using Century and Sequestered Carbon Balance Model in Anjani Watershed, uh, which is found in Amhara Regional State, Ethiopia. To give you some general introduction or general overview, as you know, the influence of human beings on the natural environment uh, has been increasing or has been recognized since the industrial revolution for example the level of carbon dioxide which is major greenhouse gas and inert as well as trace gas has been increasing from uh, uh, the in the, since the industrial revolution as well as as well as agricultural productivity is becoming low uh, that leads to the changing climate and land use land cover and uh, the increasing in population as well as the increasing in rapid infrastructure development are also expected to increase on ecosystem for uh, food production. Besides to these changes or increases to a rapid rise in release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and declining in soil carbon uh, sequestration potential. Uh, potential. Uh, as you know, soil is the largest exterior carbon pool and this largest test area uh, carbon pool has been depleted uh, due to uh, land use land cover change and uh, climate change and uh, one of the key question in most of soil organic carbon researchers are related to the fate of soil organic matter with changing in temperature and changing in land use uh, land cover change so uh, so to solve this kind of research questions there are uh, different uh, process-based models and empirical models uh, which can be used and has been used uh, in different uh, countries. What I motivated to do my PhD dissertation in this uh, area or in this field is understanding the dynamics of soil organic carbon can guide in establishing or management approach, different management approach for sustainable soil utilization as well as in my country, Ethiopia, several studies showed that uh, the high variability in topography, the high variability in geology, organic material and climate have resulted in uh, soil type and variability in Ethiopia. On the other hand, the massive land rehabilitation and conservation response by the government as well as different donor partners have been carried out since 1970s in Ethiopian calendar. But unfortunately, past research in Ethiopia focused on soil organic matter or carbon from a plant nutrition point of view. While studies on carbon sequestration started only recently, beside to this uh, uh, most previous research were more in soil degradation than rehabilitation or restoration aspects. And uh, this studies has also not paid attention to use soil carbon models. Uh, so I have different general, uh, four independent experiments for my PhD. The first experiment is evaluation of century and the sequester carbon balance models. and predict soil organic carbon stock under different land use in Anjani watershed. In this experiment, different soil physical and chemical properties will be analyzed uh, based on the model procedure, century and sequester models, initialization, validation, and calibration also will be performed. The second independent experiment is prediction of impact of climate change on soil organic carbon stock in Anjani watershed. In this experiment, we will, I will also analyze soil organic carbon change from the period 2010 up to 2100 under four climate change scenarios and one baseline scenario. 
the four climate change scenarios will be obtained from uh, coupled atmosphere ocean global climate models and the third experiment will be assessment of soil organic carbon change during the period 1984 up to 2090 under different land using ungeny watershed under ungeny watershed uh, and uh, for this experiment landsat images of different bands will be downloaded and an analyzed uh, by using arcgis uh, and landsat 5 terrain mapping and landsat 7 etm plus will be downloaded from the usgs and them also generated from uh, usgs the final experiment which is experiment for will be evaluation of selected different selected land and soil management practice on carbon sequestration and develop management recommendation in Anjani watershed rather than focusing on the, the challenges or the impacts i will also evaluate different selected land and soil management practices on carbon sequestration potential and i will also develop management recommendation for the future I have also expected outcomes. Uh, the first one is the most widely used process-based soil carbon model, which is century and sequester will be checked in the study area. Projected future regional scenarios of temperature and rainfall will be established in the watershed based on different combination of uh, general circulation models and regional climate model, as well as regional climate projections for the near terms and uh, mid century periods. Different land use land cover change Maps will be also generated during the period of 1984 up to 2090. And the other expected output will be the mainland soil management practice that affects soil organic carbon pool or sequestration potential will be also identified. The best land soil management practice that will increase carbon sequestration and agricultural pro productivity will be suggested and implemented in the watershed. And finally, at least two research outputs will be also published. Thank you for your attention. And with this, I will finalize my presentation. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so with that, we will shift to our seventh and final speaker. Um, which is Chuk Wubuka Christopher Okolo from Nigeria, um, and he will also be at Bangor University. Um, so I will just bring up his presentation now. My name is Chuk Wubuka Christopher Okolo. I'm a Nigerian citizen, and my host institute is Bangor University, UK. My PhD title is Soil Organic Carbon and Total Nitrogen Sequestration, Microbial Biomass, Primary Effects and Stability Indices on Different Land Use Types in Semi-Arid Ethiopia. The general overview of my study is all about improving soil organic carbon sequestration potential of dry land soils in semi-arid areas of northern Ethiopia. While the specific objectives include to assess and compare the impact of land use types on CO2 fluxes, microbial biomass, and soil biochemical properties in contrasting land use types using different proxies of microbial activities and spotting sea labeling in semi arid of northern Ethiopia. Two, to assess how variations in carbon and microbial biomass availability influence priming rate and magnitude. Three, to measure and compare soil organic carbon and total nitrogen concentrations and stocks of soils in contrasting land use types. And four, to determine the magnitude of soil organic carbon concentration associated with various soil aggregate sizes using different approaches of dry sieving and wet sieving under different land use types. The summary of method of analysis in general for research activities regarding our research papers we are conducted using standard laboratory analysis. So for research paper one and two, the objectives focused on analyzing soil organic carbon and total nitrogen, microbial biomass carbon and nitrogen, water extractable organic carbon, amount of added glucose mineralized to 14 CO2, and amount of 14 C in microbial biomass carbon. Then in research paper three, 
soil organic carbon to nitrogen catalytic exchange bulk density and particle size distribution we are analyzed and studied at three depths of 0 to 30 30 to 60 and 60 to 90 and the same depth uh, the compartment is equally applicable to research paper one and two then in research paper four where i uh, based my analysis on a wet aggregate separation and dry aggregate separation and try to use this a data set to generate different aggregate indices and I equally analyze the content of soil organic carbon in different soil aggregates of micro and macro sizes. So this research was conducted in four different locations in semi-arid region or Tigray region of northern Ethiopia, namely in the South Forest, Ugumbruda Forest, Hakihalet Watershed and Geregera Watershed. So for the Saar Forest and Hugumbuda Forest, they have uh, three uh, common land use types of forest, grazing land, and cropland. While in Hakihalet Watershed and Geregera Watershed, we have the exclosure, grazing land, and cropland. The key findings from this study, one, irrespective of land use type, microbial biomass carbon decreased with increasing depth as the emission of 14 CO2 and 14 C incorporation into microbial biomass. This indicates that microbial activity decreases with depth independent of land use type but with few exceptions. Secondly, higher priming in natural ecosystem compared to cropland is an indication that conversion of natural ecosystem to continuous cropping not only will lead to depletion of primable pool of carbon, but also to changes in biogeochemical carbon cycling as it led to an altered response of soil microbes to carbon inputs. Third, Conversion of forest to cropland accounted for significant losses of soil organic carbon and total nitrogen with considerable amount of CO2 emission to the atmosphere, while exclosure establishment supported restoration of degraded grazing lands with recovery of soil organic carbon and total nitrogen stocks, especially in the topsoil layer, though the duration of establishment and site-specific characteristics affect the pattern and magnitude of these dynamics. Then fourth, Soil organic carbon has strong and weak positive correlation with structural stability index and aggregate stability index respectively, implying that soil organic carbon has stronger influence on soil structural stability index than aggregate stability index. Then in conclusion, establishment of exclosure as a land restorative mechanism should be continued considering the huge impact in terms of offsetting carbon loss, especially in this current study where we have 10-year-old exclosure and improving soil organic carbon pool in addition to enhancing ecosystem services. This study supported earlier reports that conversion of native forests to other land uses results in a significant decrease in the soil organic carbon stocks, microbial biomass, and increased CO2 emission to the atmosphere, thus contributing to global warming. Finally, dry sieving could as well serve as a quick sustainable alternative to the more time-consuming and tedious wet sieving method in a semi-arid dry land in determining soil aggressibility. Thanks. Excellent. So that's all of our um, PhD students to speak. I'm wondering, Ningoni, if you're there, if you have any comments on any of the presentations that we've seen. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Jim. I have uh, a few comments, and maybe I'll start with uh, the first presentation. Ningoni, Maria, right? it's quite difficult to hear you. It's a little bit muffled. All right. Can you hear me now? Is it better? That is better, yeah. Okay. So I have a, a few questions, but I'll just go one by one. And maybe the first one will be to Maria. Uh, in terms of uh, the data that you are collecting, do, are you facing any challenges with regards to to data challenge, data quality? Uh, because I mean, the one of the things is sometimes you have different laboratories using different approaches to uh, of analysis. Are you facing that kind of challenge in your work? 
Yeah. Yes, that, I think that would be one of the major challenges in, in soil studies, especially in, in global level. Uh, we have, for example, for the for the the work I am doing here at ISRIC, we have a, a really different um, distribution of the data. So we have many many points at the USA, for example, but not much in the, in Asia, not much in Brazil. So we have uh, large areas without much data uh, and also we have to face for example uh, we are working with soil water content and sometimes it's measured uh, gravimetrically and we are not interested on that so we have to convert it it's kind of direct but it, it has some some errors and um, it carries some some errors so yes, data collecting is always a problem, especially globally, I would say. Yeah, I think, that, I mean, that's one of the challenges that you probably need to watch a lot because I remember spending uh, three months of my of my life working on some, some modeling, but then the challenge was the data was in the wrong format. So three months of my life, I was just working with the wrong data and getting crazy. And then I, when I just then asked the person who collected the data, I got the answer and then everything was solved. So it's important for you to just take take note of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's really important. I, I am trying to, to do that consistent analysis now. I was thinking it was something uh, I could do like in one or two weeks, but it took me already one month and I am still trying to to get another um, another approach and then see if it makes sense. Do not discard data that it's reasonable. Uh, but also do not use values that are, are clearly not not uh, realistic. So, yeah, that's an important part. While you're there, Maria, I'm wondering what the end use of a global soil carbon map will be. Um, would it largely be for people who are compiling inventories or for other uses? Uh, actually, I think I, can, I cannot answer this this question now because I really am not familiar with this project but uh, as far as I know it's a global soil mapping of the carbon uh, of the organic carbon stock and they, they, are, they are evaluating a spatial and temporal variation mm -hmm. so it's quite a big challenge and probably uh, in a very in a very small scale, for example, less than one kilometer. So probably it's it's available uh, within the, the soil grids um, variables, but I am just saying, I am just guessing actually. Sure. I wonder if Gerard is still on the line. No. And Nagonia, I will hand back to you if you had any other comments to make. Yeah, no, just, just on that, I mean, just in terms of utility of such a map, I guess maybe, I don't know, but I'm just thinking that maybe you could use it to identify old spots, right? Or places where where you have uh, degradation or where you're, where you're losing carbon or something like that. So I'm just thinking that you could use it as a tool to to identify places that need attention. But I don't know, I think that's, I'm just guessing that could be what the objective of the study is right now. And then uh, maybe I'll go to Eric. Eric, I, I really liked your, your study as well, just as I did Maria. And uh, my question is, are you also planning to, to do some economic analysis or are you, is, are this, do you have some economists as part of, of the project? And then the second question is, uh, how long has uh, these experiments been, been running? Um, so the first question, I'm, I'm gonna do like, um, uh, nitrogen budget, and then at the end I'm gonna try to put a dollar value on the on the nitrogen, and but that's that's all. Uh, I have someone that's gonna be taking account of the uh, ecosystem services as well in the trial, and then I and I I first started the trial in 2017, and it's still going on. So next year, um, in all the treatments that we have in there. We're gonna plant uh, peanuts 
So, and then we're gonna see the effect of the long-term rotation. It's not long-term rotation. It will be like three years on the peanuts. And then we're gonna repeat again, but it's not it's not gonna be me anymore. It's gonna be another season. Okay, no, because I, I, four years already, so it's... <laughs> okay, so, no, the question was really because, I mean, if you're thinking of, if you're also looking at carbon changes, you probably need a longer time to see some of these this changes yes. but you could you could get some indicators right if you're looking at like I, I saw you were looking at particulate organic matter as well right yes I, I am just because we can see like the changes more quickly so mm -hmm. that that's why i'm looking to the organic matter to the particulate organic matter i'm also doing the the carbon fractionation using the sieves in, from mm -hmm. zero to 15 centimeters mm -hmm. i i use I, I use like four sieves and that's another um, a variable that I'm going to be measuring there. Yeah. Yes, but yes, the trials is still going to be running for for some years. Yeah, I think also for you, I think that will be one question you will get, the economics part. Definitely in your defense, someone is going to ask you about that. So maybe just make sure that you also have those numbers uh, in place in terms of will the farmer adopt and what would it take for a farmer to adopt? Do they need government support or do they need support from you know, but the numbers in the end we have a lot there's a lot of technology but sometimes everything just falls apart on numbers right for example for the, the first chapter of my thesis and the one and the one that i'm talking about the little decomposition i'm putting everything on a nitrogen basis how much nitrogen is going back to the system and i, I forgot to mention but uh, it was in the pictures i'm i'm evaluating the nitrogen return from the above ground a portion of the plant and also from the roots so it's not only the the, the above ground part that's going to be contributing to the nitrogen to the nitrogen and nutrient cycling so we are also accounting for the roots which is really important yeah. but yes at the end it, I, I, i'll try to put some conclusions on the dollar value but mostly i'm focusing the nitrogen amount thank you which is going to be I mean, if I if I put a value on the nitrogen amount that you can uh, save, and also on the cotton yield, uh -huh. it, it, it's easy to do that. But it gets more complicated when we try to put the the animal data into account, right? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. we are just mimic, mimicking the grazing there. We we don't have the animals there for the whole month, for example. So oh, okay. it, it gets yeah. more difficult to put the animal value on that, but we can do estimates because we have some similar trials. I mean, trials that the animals are grazing the same type of forage. Uh, okay. But 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 yes, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do add some content. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And then I have a question for for Ricardo. It's, uh, in terms of. Uh, Nitrogen application in Brazil, is it a common practice? And uh, if it is, are you taking that into account in your, in, your, in your experiments? If it is not, then probably you, the focus would then have to be just urine and dung, right? I don't know, is it, is it a common practice for farmers to apply nitrogen um, in pastures? And that's for Ricardo. So maybe Ricardo, maybe you could answer later. But then the final question I have is for Anthony, and Anthony, the the question is on related to. I see Ricardo's carbon. Data you short. Do you have some? Uh... Okay, sorry. Okay. Are you there, Ricardo? Uh, Ricardo, please feel free to respond to Negroni's question. Hi. Hi. Can, go ahead. Uh, can can you repeat, please, uh, the question? Oh, wow. Okay, so the question was, uh, I, I, uh, in your experiment here, you are looking at uh, uh, Bracaria, right? And the idea, the question is really, in terms of nitrogen application, is it a common practice for farmers in Brazil to apply uh, fertilizer in pastures? Uh, and if it is, are you applying the rates that they, are you going to apply the rates that they use? Or if it is not, 
are you then going just to focus on urine? Uh, and thanks for your question. Uh, not a uh, fertilizer with the nitrogen in pasture is not very common. Uh, is some 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 pasture is is this use uh, nitrogen, but is uh, and can I say extensive system extensive system but in but in common areas uh, it's, it's not common application the nitrogen because uh, I, and and I use the urine in my experiment because this some producer use the nitrogen and the others is not used I don't know if I respond to your question. Okay, so 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 if you are, so you are not using fertilizer in your experiment. I thought on one of the experiments you said nitrogen application. Maybe I got it wrong. But yeah, I think that's that's fine. And then uh, the next question will be to Anthony. And Anthony, you showed just some carbon uh, values, but my my question, you showed that the carbon was going up and down as you go down with depth. But do you have any uncertainties in terms of errors for these numbers? So will, will they be significantly different or is that uh, uh, probably not something to worry about? Yeah, um, sorry, I see that Anthony's dropped off the phone call, but that would have been a good question to know the answer for. <laughs> okay. okay, so otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So I think uh, I'll just, Perfect. How about if any of the other students, does anyone have any questions that they wish to ask? Feel free to raise your hand or um, unmute yourself and ask a question. We currently have Maria, Eric, Ricardo on the call. So Nelly, please go ahead. Hello. Hi Nelly, we can Hello? hear you. Oh, okay, good. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all the presenters. Um, actually, my question goes to George. Um, specifically to his methodology. Um, there are several methods uh, to evaluate soil microbial uh, diversity. So I would like to know why uh, he has chosen a chlorophyll fermentation uh, in spite of some others accurate and more efficient techniques like uh, a peel of a That's my question. Unfortunately, Nelly, I don't believe we have George on the on the call. Um, we just had a little bit of a bad connection with your question there as well. But if you email that question through, um, we can pass that on and make sure it goes to him. Okay, I'll type my question then. Sounds good. Does anyone else have any questions for either Maria or Ricardo or Eric? Um, maybe Anthony might join us again. No questions. <laughs> All right. Um, with that, Ningoni, did you have any final comments to make? No, I think uh, I really enjoyed listening to the presentation and, uh, and seeing the, the direction the, the Cliff Grad students are taking. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the results and the outputs. I don't know if there's going to be some webinar later here, so where people present the results of their work or something. It's interesting now we have. It's, with, it's kind of like an appetizer for, for us, right? And, but it should be interesting to see what comes out of it and uh, what are the outputs, the outputs of it. And, and then maybe then we could also discuss what are the application and what does it mean to the farmers and what does it mean for the, for the climate and, and how can we use the results to inform policies and to inform management practices that farmers are talking. So I, I think it will be interesting later to see what comes out of it.
Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully there will be some opportunity in the future to, to discuss um, the results of all of the research and hopefully that discussion might even be able to be held across multiple different rounds because obviously these are just the round three students and um, once the round four students have completed their research and we obviously have um, more of the, the older alumni from round one and round two, it would be great to get everyone together to discuss. So yeah, thank you once again, Ningoni. It's been lovely to have you and lovely to hear the bird song in the background from you as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thanks to all of our student presenters. And yeah, I hope you all have either a lovely evening or a lovely day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.